That's enough of that. Well, folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. And <laughs> here in, um, what, what city are you living in? Lake, nice. ba Lake Balboa. Yes, yeah, Lake Balboa. And uh, joined here by a master drummer and a fantastic human being, Stephen Ferroni. Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you very much. I was watching a YouTube clip before um, you came home, and uh, the engineer with Petty was saying when you came into that studio, the, the drums were going, someone's drums were going out. Yes. And you were, you were like, is this a rehearsal or not? And basically when you came in, at that point, the engineer, I forget his name, said, T Tom doesn't need to worry about the drums anymore. Right. What does that mean? Well, uh, uh, you know, I guess... Uh you kind of create a, a comfort zone around around uh, whatever the leaders. That's what I do. I mean, I, I kind of figure out where their comfort zone is, and then uh, and then then uh, let them have it. You know, so they don't really have to. Uh, they really shouldn't have to think about what I'm playing. You know, it's kind of like if you're playing with a bass player. You really shouldn't have to think about what he's playing. A bass player, a bass Mike, player. I guess the better question is this. What is someone like Petty concerned about with a drummer? Is it what we just talked about with tempo, slowing down and speeding up? Out and it was about when a when a kid goes goes bad and goes goes crazy. You know, trying to think of what what happened to the kid. You, know? you want to know something so crazy is that that entire thing that you ripped on with Petty. Yeah. It, it, the internet disconnected. Now it's back on. We missed that whole story, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Tom doesn't want that stuff being shared. My but, internet went down. Well, the, the wireless was like it was like you know, and I didn't finish. It. I said it's going to uh, come back. It's going to come back. So just for the audience who missed it. Petty was worried about a cat that could that was either that just couldn't keep the tempo. I mean, you well, locked yeah, that in. I mean, it was, yeah. he, he didn't want to have to. He wanted to, have to, to think about what he was playing in the song and about how the song was going. He didn't want to have to think about what I was playing. Absolutely, yeah. uh, Stephen Ferroni. I want to. I was curious about this in, in France. Did you run across guys like Jagger and McLaughlin at that time? And was no. there a Chitlin circuit in Europe? Uh, there was a circuit, and yeah, when I lived in in, uh, in Italy, there was a circuit for sure. There was I worked with a guy named Ronnie Jones. Uh, he, he's in Milan now. He's eighty years old. God bless him. What 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 instrument is Ronnie play? He was a singer. A singer. So yeah. the, okay. So and then can you talk about the the towns you would visit? Uh, well, we play like in uh, oh Rimini and uh, Milan, Torino. We played in Torino a lot. There was a club in Torino uh, called uh, Macuno. It was a, a, a pretty good club for, for musicians to play. And that was where I met Brian Olga. Then. Really? Yeah. In uh, in the Macuno, and uh, Rome, of course, uh, Naples, uh, Bologna, um, and a lot of little towns that sort of surrounding there. They used to have these big clubs sort of surrounding some of these little towns. It was a little town outside of Florence that we used to play. You know, but they had a big club, and so people would drive out to these locations and uh, just dance and listen to bands. Um, so, but as far, did you meet the blues masters from this country that you got to play with, like on that burglar record? Like, no, where, where, I never got how to. did you like? Did you only meet them when you came here? I never. I, I never. Well, I met them. I met. I met some of them. Some of them here in in the United States, and mainly when I was with Petty, that's when I got to meet them. But um, I used to go and see them play. They used to come and play on, on tours in uh, in uh, in England. They'd come and play at the Dome in Brighton. And uh, the, the 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 older guys, I was like 12 years old, and I was playing with these guys that were 18. And uh, they they uh, used to take me down and see these guys play. I, I should have paid more attention, really. <laughs> was the music, did you get off on the music? Oh, yeah. Or were you just looking at all the... No, I loved the, it. I loved it. What about what did you about the feel of the of the shuffle? Did did you did you learn? At the, what was the th the thing that you took away the most? Was it just the authenticity of what they were what they were? I just loved their pocket. It was like it was the, the way there was some things that you know. It was funny because I was talking to I was talking I went I was back in Brighton uh, uh, last year, and I went and visited the guy who was the lead singer in that in my first band, and uh, and we were reminiscing about when they used to. Basically, I was thanking him for taking me to see those guys. Right. And he, and he said stuff like, well, you know, remember they used to do things like a 13 and a half bar blues? And I said, you know, it's funny because, like, over the years I've learned that they used to do these, these odd measures, but it would, be, it would be something that would repeat. I don't know whether it was like they just sort of add, like, one bar 
somewhere. It wasn't just like a straight 12 bar that they would play. They would add a bar somewhere, you know, or, or a bar and a half sometimes. But it was, it was always had this, uh, but when you listen to it, it was always like, well, did somebody just make a mistake, you know? It, this is fascinating because how much of that had to do with the fact that the guitar was not a lead instrument at, at, well in the sense that it was more of a rhythm instrument it was a rhythm instrument yeah and so therefore it was they could stretch more yeah and they, they could add a place for a breath too you know it could breathe it would be like music has trouble just like add an extra beat somewhere you know they just but it would be it would be something that they would always do it would always be there that extra beat um, one cat I've actually not asked you about is uh, George Duke. Yeah. Uh, the the YouTube clips are ferocious. They're they're great. Your your playings. What did you? How did you meet George? And then ultimately, what is? What did you get off on the most in that band? Oh well, you know, I met George through Jeffrey Osborne. Um, Jeffrey Osborne. Um, what was his original band? Um, you're asking the wrong cat. Oh, uh, uh, they did Back in Love Again. Um, if the audience knows, please chime in. <laughs> uh, I don't even have my no, don't even worry, so I, I even. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Yeah. Well, but but Je Osborne it, it, it told Duke about you. How, how did that work? Yeah, well, Jeffrey, Jeffrey was in this band, and they were opening. They used to open for Average White Band. And we were in a party in Bowling Green. I'll never forget it. We were in Bowling Green, Ohio. And we were in this like room in this uh, after party, after show party. There was all these people in this room. And Jeffrey came through the crowd and he said, when I do my solo album, you're going to play drums on it. Yeah. And I said, yeah, yeah, Jeffrey, have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, it was like some years later, uh, I got this phone call uh, from George's uh, uh, people and like, can you come out and do the record? Jeffrey's doing the solo record. Will you come out and play on it? And so I came out and that was where I got to meet George and... Uh, Played with Lewis Johnson and uh, and all the guys that he had on the record. It was just great. Yeah. In, in the live, were the show were the sh were the live shows different than what came out on the recording? I mean, did you did you improvise more in a live setting, or no. was the audience coming? Part of my issue today is it's a formula trip. I mean, yeah. you, you <clears throat> just going back to the Oblivion Express albums. You listen to the studio tracks, and they're great. You listen to them live. And they go up tenfold. Yeah, it, it, it's well, burning, and, and the audience, whether they appreciated it, whether they care, you didn't care because you were loving the music, and the music felt so good, and there was a lot of collective consciousness at that time. Are you talking about the George Duke tour? Well, no. What I, well, I guess I segue. I'm just talking about the idea with Duke. Yeah. yeah. Specifically, was it very? Uh, was it like you know? Very understood, well, had, or, or was, was there room for a lot of imp openness? Well, he had, um, he had. Uh, I mean, you could pretty much, you could pretty much do 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 what you want. But he had these songs. I mean, he had he had these things that he was doing. He had a great rhythm section. Yeah, uh, um, uh, uh, Paul Jackson Jr. Uh, and uh, and Lewis Johnson and George. You know, and um, and it was. Uh, it, it was it was all pretty easy. It all just fell fell together pretty easy, but. It was a little bit different the, the stuff because George George was producing more sort of straight R and B stuff, and his stuff always had like a little bit of something extra to it, like it's something a little bit sort of left field would come out of left field. It was the psychedelic thing of the Bay Area or something. Yeah. I, I feel that. I want you to talk to younger cats out there watching worldwide. Um, what were your intentions for getting into music? Just to play. I just thought I just wanted to play. And you played? Do you play for free a lot? Yeah, I, I played. I played for free. I just played. You know. Uh, well, you know, it was like it was kind of it was kind of weird. It was like uh, uh, I loved doing it, and because I loved doing it, I would make money doing it somehow. You know, I mean, I I don't even remember what I got paid for playing in. Uh, I used to play in this band Gonzalez in England, and we used to make a little bit of money. Nothing. You know, it was a bunch of studio musicians that would get together and go. Play at Ronnie Scott's. What was the instrumentation? Oh, the big horn section. It was, a, it was like you know, five piece horns, of, uh, two guitars. It was a big, big R and B band. Yeah, yeah. And was there a lead singer? A couple of different ones. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so, so you would, and but that wasn't there wasn't a lot of money to go around. No, but we'd have a lot of fun doing it. And 
people would come then to, to the club, like producers and stuff would come to the club. That was where I got uh, uh, the Freddie King album. They hired that band to play on the Freddie, on the Burglar album, on Freddie King's album. Um, you have a gig tomorrow night? Can you, or you're, you're sitting in at a jam? Tomorrow, tomorrow morning. No, but tomorrow morning, <laughs> well, well, I'll be there. But then uh, Julia, your your wife, your lovely wife, was, oh, yeah, was yeah, talking yeah. about like like My you, to my girlfriend. It's girlfriend. Yeah. So yeah, girlfriend. Uh, can you can you talk about the cats you're playing with and how how much fun it is? You know why it's fun to play with Toshi and yeah, with uh, to Toshi and Jurgen. Well, you know to Toshi's got we we play we play like film music. Sometimes it's a uh, 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 Enter the Dragon or At L Lalo Schifrin or, yeah. or the Henry Mancini stuff, yeah, the it, cop show themes. There's a, it, we do that, and then there's some other stuff that he does, which is always like a little bit. A little bit strange. Some of some stuff that he's written himself. Uh, I, I think he's doing this song, Thunderbird, which is kind of like. A... It's just uh, it's one of those one of those things. You know? It's a uh, guitar driven. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean. It's just fun to play. The, the, you haven't been to the uh, baked potato when we play, right? No, no, I've not been there. You have a gig there every month or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the jam set. I want you. To, what does a jam session look like in 2018? In, in so far as like you're playing a couple of tunes tomorrow night. Yeah. How many cats are showing up? Are there lines out the door? It's Steve Gadd's birthday, and on the Lower East Side, you know, they used to have these clubs, and there'd be just horn players and, and lined up around the corner. You yeah. know, it was like. It was a cutting. Sh is is it still that way? What what's the vibe there? I don't know. I never go out at night. <laughs> but you're playing. You're going to. <laughs> well, I'm going out tomorrow night. You play two tunes though, right? I mean, you're playing a couple of tunes. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I we're just playing. Uh, uh, we've we've been given a time slot, so I'm going to get there about nine thirty. I think we play at ten, and then I'm going to go play that, and then I'm going to come back here because went the next morning. I got to pack and I got to finish packing up my stuff, and I got to leave. I got to China. Where are you? What are you doing over there? Playing with Nathan East. Um, some final uh, uh, words of wisdom about uh, uh, Tom Petty. I mean, it was uh, it, it hit a lot of people hard. People that didn't even, you know. Well, you know, I think everybody got touched by Tom. You know, somehow it, it, his 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 songwriting was just so. Uh, I don't know. It was. It, it, I think every. You know. I I I said on my, my on the radio show once I did an I did an interview they were to, to you know people everybody thought that the, there was a song that Tom wrote that was just for them. There was a guy there was a guy <laughs> there was a guy that when uh, Tom was out when he lived here he used to go he used to like to go to Tower Records on Ventura Boulevard uh -huh. and he was in there like looking through some records and this guy came up and said hey man Tom Petty right. <laughs> He said, man, he said, you know, I love your new album, which is Wildflowers. You know. He said, great. He said, I especially love that song about eating pussy. He said, what are you, what are you talking about? He said, you know, that, that song about pussy. He said, uh, does it, what, what, song, what song was that? He said, Cabin Down Below. <laughs> everybody had their own, imp everybody has their own way of, 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 t of taking it in. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, he pulled people in. Uh, it's a yeah. similar... Uh, so he, he's, 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 he's songwriting, his songwriting and his performance would touch people. I mean, I knew a girl who just loved to hear him say Velvet. And she would listen, she would go back up on the CD, she'd back up and just listen. Just for the one word. For that one word. Listen to the way he says Velvet, Velvet. Be there in Velvet and good to be king. Um, I want you to t tell the audience, uh, maybe you, you'll tell it a different one, but... Um... You had, you became more sympathetic to leaders when you became a leader. Yes. Explain why. Well, you know, it's like <laughs> I know. I, I want that. Yeah. <laughs> it's your it's your gig, your respons your responsibility, and and people are going to be looking at you, and you want to hear things a certain way. You know. Now, uh, uh, it's not it's not always that you know you hire the people that you want to play because you know that they can play. But then sometimes you're playing something and it's like, uh, you know, and you have to be the asshole. Now, I, I, got a, I got a great, there's a great story for you. Now, I never told this story. Okay. This one's going out. This is going out worldwide. There it is, baby. <laughs> Let it out. 
I got inducted into the Rock, Rock Walk of Fame that, over there in the, on the Sunset Boulevard. And they said I could put a band together, any band that I wanted. So I tried to put together the original Average White Band. Half of them was still, were working somewhere else. So I got Hamish and I got Molly. And I got a whole bunch of other guys, that, that I, other players. I got Osnoy came and played. Will Lee came and played. Um, uh, who else is that? Uh, oh, um, is how, uh, many, how, how big a band? Uh, let me see. It was uh, uh, Larry Williams. So it was Larry Williams on alto, Molly on uh, on uh, on tenor saxophone, uh, Hamish on guitar, Osnoy on guitar, Will Lee on bass, um, and uh, and uh, and uh, and my 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 roadie was singing background for some background vocals, <laughs> and we were doing uh, oh and Benmont played keyboards. And so I got people from like various parts of my life to play. And um, I have a good friend, Steve Perry. And he he hadn't performed in years, but he was started to go around and hang out at rehearsals and stuff. And he, and he, and he, and he asked if he could come down to, mm. to, to listen to Hamish sing, because he loves Hamish sing. So we were, <laughs> we were down there and rehearsing, we were rehearsing person to person, and there was a harmony that I was missing in the backgrounds. And I said, you know, there's... There's a there's a note that's missing in, in there's a note that's missing, and they're like well, and it's, it's, let's play it and they were singing person to person and like, no is there a note missing is it you know and <laughs> like, well, I don't know what note there's a note missing it's not sounding right and I'm getting more and more aggravated because I can't tell you what note it is. <laughs> right? And, you're the leader, and, though, and right? You're the leader. Me, yeah, and people are looking at me like, well, you know, he's the drummer, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> and I'm saying, look, there's a, and Steve Perry was sitting there and he knew what note it was. Yeah. So he started playing. So all of a sudden, Steve gets up and goes to the microphone and sings it, sings the note, and I said, there it is, there it is. You're in the band. <laughs> and Steve said, what? I said, you're in the band, you've got to be in the band, nobody else can sing that note. And so... He came and he was exactly. Well, no, yeah, and that's what you were talking about. You said you said sometimes as the leader, you bring people together that you want to play with that right. are going to create and make it and make it feel good and, and sound good. But then sometimes you want a certain note, right? And someone says, "But that doesn't make sense," right? And you said, "No, but that's what I, I want." Hear. That's what I want. Yeah, and that and that's kind of like when you when you're dealing with with the leader in a band when you're de when the leader has that response and the leader turns around. And the thing is this, it might not be the, the thing that I was thinking of or the note that I was thinking of, or whatever, but I want something that isn't there. And then that's why I got these guys there, because I know that they can give me that. And that's what, uh, that's what Tom had in the Heartbreakers. He had a bunch of guys around him that if he said that detail doesn't sound right in the song, that they could, we could home in on that and we could fix it. You know? And that's what... Uh, uh, Petty was a great leader in in, the, in, in that fact. In uh, uh, that he could, he put the, the the guys together that he knew that he could trust, that he could he, he could trust with his music. That if there was something that wasn't going right, who would find out what it was and then do it? Yeah. Well, that that clip with the engineer was uh, was fascinating, just because yeah. he said it was just end of story once you walked in. Um, a, a cat who will be watching later on. Um, just. I was really invigorated going back and listening, and you talked about um, your favorite drummer being Jack DeJohnette, yeah. even though you play nothing like Jack no. DeJohnette. So explain what stands out about Jack D and why you love him. I mean, it's like maybe it's but even it's I for, love the way that he listens to everybody in the band. I love the way that he can pick up on something and make it important that somebody else is playing. That he can point you in a direction. He can point you. He can he can hold a band together, and then somebody over here be playing something. Will be saying something, and he'll point you straight at that guy. Check that out, you know. Uh, Never obnoxious, always just right. Anything yeah. else that's going yeah. on over yeah. here. No, he and he's a great piano player. Absolutely, he's, and you hear music, that. You music. hear it. Mu the musicality, yeah, of of the drumming is phenomenal. There was a, an album that he did called the Dijonet Experience. Did you ever hear that? Sure. He plays melodica beautifully. He plays anything. Have Roy Haynes playing drums on that. Um, tomorrow, uh, I will come see you to play bebop, but, yeah, uh, maybe come see bebop as, at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, what's the name of the restaurant, by the way? I think it's very hip because jazz John's used to be... Coffee Roaster. Because 
jazz used to be like late night jam yeah. music, right? Now it's perfect for yoga time in the morning. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, when they called me to, because I never get to play, I have a bebop kit. I have, I have a, I have a little Gretsch bebop kit that I love. You know? <laughs> and I never get to play it. And I, and, 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 uh, and they said, you know, we're, we're doing this uh, jazz gig. You know, we're doing, and I said, well, uh, can you come? Can we come and play? I said, "Yeah, I'd love to do that. You know, that sounds cool. I'd like to do that." They said, "Okay, uh, the, you, I don't even have to take a kid out there. They got a kid." So I said, "Got an eighteen-inch, eighteen-inch boat? Yeah, it's got an eighteen-inch. Okay, fine." Right. And uh, I go out there, and uh, uh, oh, and uh, and I say, "Okay, so where, where's the gig? It's at Jones Coffee Roasters in Pasadena." Okay, what time is it? What time is it? What time are you hitting? Eight a.m. I beg your pardon? 8 a.m. You're like, is it a session? No, you're like, no it's, a, it's a gig. Yeah, it's a gig. And I got to get from here, uh, you know, about LA traffic, but from here to Pasadena can sometimes be a nightmare. So that means I have to, I have to be like leaving about quarter to seven to, to get there. It's good to know. So, uh, so, so I say, okay, I'll do it. But the reason that I went to do it was just to see if it was going to happen. You know? And then I got there. And we started playing. I see people sort of wandering in, kind of in a bad mood, having to go to work on a Tuesday morning, and you know, well, uh, this to take care of and that to take care of, and then they get their coffee, and then they sort of listen to the music, and then they listen to the music for a bit. And uh, and uh, I and, dig and it, they, man. They it'd be dust, they're washing away the dust of everyday life with yeah. that stuff, man. Yeah. That's what Blake used to say. And then they go. You're just doing it in the morning now, not at, yeah. not now in the speakeasy. That's right. And then they and, and then now there's like like a regular little crowd. I've started noticing there's some regular faces that sort of go in there on that Tuesday morning. They sort of sit in there and they they just listen to it and read their newspapers and drink their coffee and listen to the listen to the listen to the music, and really listen to the music because they applaud and they they applaud the solos and they you know. And it's and it's also you have to be really self disciplined because the piano is not amplified. The bass the bass has a little amp, but uh, you know you really, you really it's really sort of with with brushes too a lot. Yeah, and brushes and yeah, it's it's really. But you got the really eighteen acoustic. inch you got the eighteen inch bass drum and the eighteen inch kick. Yeah. Um, but before we wrap, uh, could you? It's a Remo kit, so you know, it, it's a, but they they set it up for me so. I'd like to have my great. You're out at 6.45 in the morning. I mean, it's... I have done... It's yeah, labor. Well, I want to go set up my own... Do you still hit traffic at 6.45? At, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, uh, uh, I have... Uh, I've had the, I had this... The, the, we call it the coffee shop trio, or sometimes it's a coffee shop quartet. I think it might be a quartet tomorrow because they're talking about saxophone player coming. We need... Sometimes we, we have a guitarist and we played at the, uh, at the, at the, uh, at the, at the Malibu Guitar Festival uh, last year. And uh, brought the house down. They really loved it. So, so uh, they're, they're going to. That's going to become sort of a fixture in the Malibu Guitar Festival. Could you play a cop show theme before we uh, before we wrap? Well, I, you Stephen know, I, Peroni I, I style. Play, I play, I'm going to play. Well, play uh, some Edward the Dragon, we, maybe. I mean, I, I, for Jake Feinberg, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, um, okay. So, 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 so.
one I like that we do the zombie yeah. we do the enter the zombie one. The zombie one took me a little bit of work to do. <laughs> Holy so mom. Yo, Stephen Ferroni, thank you for rocking my world and being part of the program. Hey, you're man. welcome. Love always. Peace.